Hi. Yeah. Welcome back. Right? Yeah, this is uh, the Dark Path Podcast right. again, and uh, we're very happy and, and grateful to have John Foster joining us again. Okay. Um, and today I uh, want to jump right in and yep. uh, start off with a bit of your background, your professional academic background, um, and how it relates to conversations about anything from mythology to human behavior to sort of politics, you know, they're, they're all connected into this right. concept. So, uh, Sure. Yeah, uh, so in terms of psychology, uh, depth psychology, I, um, I studied at, um, with the Joseph Campbell and, and uh, C.G. Young Institutes in California and uh, also studied in Master University Psychology, Standard Psychology. Um, how I got into the idea, how the connection between uh, uh, psychology and mythology came to, came to be was um, of course I spent a long time as we discussed last time in Japan, and I was you know just looking at the the, the stories that were involved and talking to people about uh, their 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 sense of what they believe uh, the world is is so, was so different from what we believe and it's, there was a sense of what I wanted to know what the what at a deeper level what what was the source of this it's not just culture. In a general sense, there's individual uh, understandings and storytellings and ways of organizing the mind uh, and thinking about and, and mapping out how this image of reality may have uh, mm-hmm. developed. So the images of reality mm-hmm. are uh, what um, interested interested me. So what are the, so, for example, Vico, the great uh, um, uh, philosopher Vico, said that. Uh, um, the, that he, he took the example of the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, and he said, okay, the Greeks were had this image of reality that we cannot understand. Mm-hmm. Now, he, I'm not saying that he believed that there was no way of understanding. He said if you studied hard, you would have to study hard and really look deeply into what the meaning of, the, of that image was. How did that, was that image developed? In what, what were the stories? What were the foods? What were the rituals and myth, myths and, and ways of acting? The environment that they had to deal with it, the problems and tasks that they had. And all of that together uh, coalesced into a certain image of reality that we couldn't just look at and say the Greeks were this or the Greeks were that. And he said it was not just a, a sense of uh, time, but also space. So a, a different group that may have been, um, you know, contemporary with the ancient Greeks would have a different image of reality. And it's not saying that one was right or wrong, mm-hmm. uh, that but that there was something that helped coalesce it. And I came to the understanding that uh, it was pr- many things, of course, but primarily the stories that people tell. And I'm not talking about, mm-hmm. you know, the current politics of the narr- the, the, the narrative and all this sort of thing where you're trying to the top-down forcing of narratives on peoples. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the stories that people told within a very specific context, a very, you know, mountains or fields, rice fields, how the stories change. So, for example, in my research in Japan on um, the mountain kami, we talked about last time, and uh, the stories that were told in the Jomon era, uh, Jomon period, which was, um, you know, a a long period of time that was... uh, uh, pre, um, pre, uh, pre uh, Neolithic, right. and so the Neolithic Revolution in Japan is is uh, marked by what's called the Yayoi period. Now the stories that we have left over from the uh, that we can find, of course, from the Jomon period, the way they were altered to fit the reality mm-hmm. of the introduction of, of rice farming, uh, wet paddy mm-hmm. farming, uh, just that 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 would weave together a sense of who the people were. And if you look at that historically, you see that um, a lot of what they were was uh, arrived at in personal stories yeah. and dreams. And we'll talk about dreams later because depth psychology talks about dreams a bit. But just as a general introduction, how I'm coming from it. Uh, so when I did the research uh, in the small town Arakawa mm-hmm. in southern Japan, mm-hmm. uh, in Kagoshima. I lived in a small community called Nakaji, Nak- Nakamugi. And Nakamugi, in the Nakamugi area, they had, um, I did research by talking with people, just living, it was, was basic standard uh, participation uh, ethnography, and which uh, you work and you live and you uh, note and do research. And um, so, for example, the stories of what 
the um, ritual, for example, if you think there's a ritual and a story behind uh, planting rice. Yeah. Okay, so what, and you might say, okay, well, that is just a, a ritual or it's just a story that was told. But if you ask the people and how they rework it and how they, they use it and how they alter it, it's quite interesting. So in my book, uh, I talk about how uh, I actually, as because I was a member of the, the, the men's community there, the father, it was actually more the father's community. Mm. It's called Sailor Moon. Uh, yeah, Sailor Moon. <laughs> yeah, I think I mentioned that last time, did I? Yeah. Yeah, the Sailor Moon where we, we yeah. Anyway, so, but we, in one particular, uh, one cultural festival, they reenacted the story of the rice god. Right. And I was the rice god. Oh, yeah, so, so I had to act. So they, they had an old blonde wig and they, they put little dots on my face to make me look really ugly because the, uh, the, 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 it's the mountain candy. Right. The mountain candy comes down and fertilizes the rice, okay. turns into the rice god. So there's a uniting of the, the stones that mm. are uh, phallic shaped mm. and uh, the female mountain candy comes down sure. and it's the uniting together and then there's fertilization. So tradition. So you might some somebody might analyze it from a ritualistic perspective. This means that. This means that. But if you analyze it from a story way perspective, you say these were most of these men also owned uh, fields and they were still rice farmers. And they had an idea of how this um, mountain kami comes down in the story. What what happens in the story is she she proceeds down in the spring, but then uh, ends up in, in, in unites. But in this particular story, which is retold and retold in many variations throughout Japan, she the stops and she accidentally sees a mirror, mm. and she looks in the mirror and sees herself, mm -hmm. and she sees how ugly she is. So she becomes embarrassed and she hides herself. So the rice becomes, uh, so the rice does not get fertilized, mm. and the heart and the harvest goes, goes goes mm. to, to, just doesn't, doesn't grow. Happen, yeah. It doesn't happen. So she, so. What they had to do is figure out how to make her laugh at herself. Uh -huh. Do you see what I mean? So the story is uh -huh. they're trying to make her, you know, she, she's uptight and tense. Oh, I'm terrible. I'm evil. It's, it's an inner sense of who mm. she is. As, as a, she, I should not be so ugly. Mm. You see what I mean? Mm. So there's that. But the way to solve the problem was that they made her laugh, made her relax. And she finally said, oh, okay, who cares? Huh. The way they did that. Huh. Uh, just in case you, you want to know, just the, the, the way that they did it, they took the this the ugliest of fit, all fish, the rock fish. Oh, yeah, 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 I heard this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I told I told you a story last time. Yeah, it's a good story. Yeah, the Atakabu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the Atakabu yeah, yeah. in Atakawa, so that's kind of Atakawa Atakabu, uh, kind of like a pun. But it's it's also called different things in different parts of Japan. So it's just an ugly, ugly rock fish, yeah. and they showed her the rock fish, and she realized, oh that's even uglier than me so I, it, it's okay it's fine okay. so then she fertilizes the rice and the story's over yeah. similar stories happen um it depends on the community because it's almost the same story that's in the kojiki mm -hmm. from the sixth century japan mm -hmm. and it's the story that was for the elite class the rich the the part the, the courtesans and, mm -hmm. and everyone who so that in that story amateresu the god, sun god yes also uh from the prop, she has the problem that her brother just just does all kinds of in the Kojiki. It's different from other texts, but uh, her brother's a troublemaker and he does something evil and she hates it and she hides herself and right. everything goes dark. Yes, right. Yeah. So the way they get her out is also with a mirror. Yeah. And in this case, they of course the the kagura the the dances for the gods that occur still to this day um, is her, it's, it's her story mm -hmm. and they're dancing and singing, trying to make her have fun. And she still won't come out, but finally they they keep going and they keep dancing. And she opens it just a little mm. bit to see what's going on. And they put a mirror there. Mm. And she, in this case, she sees a beautiful woman because right. yeah, she's beautiful. And they, uh, she says, "How can there be a beautiful woman?" And everyone's happy. What's going on? She comes out, and then they close the door and keep her out. Mm. It becomes sun, and she relaxes and mellows. Everyone's having fun. Yeah. It's the same story. And so these stories, um, where do they come from is a good a question that uh, depth psychology will talk about. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can talk about that today. But do you see where I'm, I'm coming from, from my, that's where I come from in terms of motivation, yeah. Yeah. why I think depth psychology is important. Yeah. Even though I had studied at McMaster, like, you know, the standard psychology, behavioral psychology, cognitive psychology, yeah. and uh, that's. Well, that's the whole thing of when the rubber hits the road kind of thing. Yeah. It, it makes it real. 
But now, um, I'd like to maybe take a step back, though, for, for the listeners in the sense that maybe um, the people listening to don't really have a good sense of what even psychology is to begin with. Right. And never mind, like, this specific gap psychology thing. Yeah. So if, if you would, would mind maybe just start exploring the background of that and sort of overview of what it is. Of psychology? And particularly, too, for people, again, listening who don't really necessarily put a lot of gravity towards the, the, the validity of these kinds of studies is why you think it would be relevant to consider these factors in life in general. Good, good question. Uh, yeah, so um, psychology itself um, has a long history, of course, and the, the analysis of dreams, we could say the analysis of dreams, is something that was um, an integral part of all societies. Most culture, every culture has it, Japan as well, and we'll talk about that later, but certainly in ancient Greece, in, in, in all European traditions, the analysis of your what's going on in, in the inside of the mind. Mm-hmm. And so it's so an analysis of what is happening inside. Now, depth psychology, we'll put aside for a second, uh, what we call psychology these days are the sciences. So they are, so they are analysis, for example, behavioral psychology, which is not really a mainstream anymore. But when I was studying at McMaster in the 1980s, we still did a lot of work. Uh, for example, uh, you would um, analyze pigeons we, we had to teach pigeons how to do certain things okay. that was that was a project so okay. basically there was um, you know Pavlov's dog and uh, mm-hmm. you used uh, treats and you use uh, we still do that for t- training puppies yeah. uh, the idea that um, if you there's what is the motivation mm-hmm. for doing things is behavioral psychology mm-hmm. right so they want to know uh, how can we a lot of it's about control right so that's that's a that's a problem Skinner talked about Skinner was famously said if you give me a baby, I'll, I'll put him in a box and I'll turn him into anything I want. Mm. So it's kind of the blank slate. Mm. Now the blank slate is, has been opposed by cognitive psychology, which does not believe in a blank slate. Mm-hmm. They believe that you're given certain, uh, we are born with specific uh, cognitive uh, faculties mm-hmm. that um, allow us to um, link through, beha- through our behavior, through our experience in the world, um, develop. Yeah. These, um, they're like organs. Yeah, yeah. So the concept of the mind being an organ, yeah. you see, and so in the modern sciences, we no longer they no longer talk about the mind. The reason is it's not, um, it's not defined well enough. Mm. So in modern psychology, they talk about the brain, mm. and they'll talk about how which which areas of the brain are doing this, and you can. So science needs. An object, a physical object, yeah. right? So you need to be able to test it and retest it. It has to be, you know, there has to be um, uh, repetitiveness. It has to be, they have to be repeated. Uh, if it can't be, it's not a science. Yeah. So psychology can be a science. My first degree was in science. Hmm. So we studied behaviorism, we studied cognitive psychology, we studied neurobiology mm. and, uh, you know, paths, which areas of the brain, which they have much more technology now. <laughs> I mean, when I was, when I was in, the, in McMaster in the 1980s, we, we, when they studied, uh, for example, rat, rats in a, tr- in a maze, and they want to know what part of the brain they're using mm. for this particular task. And they would teach them the task, then they would take them and quick freeze them. Uh, and slice their brains really thinly to see, see what yeah. <laughs> but that they don't have to do that anymore with yeah. the, with the sketch so the science so psychology can be a science okay and uh but psychology uh cognitive science, science cognitive psychology itself is a science as well because it's uh, we can uh there is a thesis and a testable a testable thesis that can be repeated yeah so there's no object necessarily. That not a fit, I mean, although there are different types of cognitive psychology where it's closer to the biological realm, sure. where they analyze areas, yeah. and so so. I mean, it gets to a point where it's it's quite scientific, it's quite specific, and it's it's is it applicable to everyday life? Is the question? The question of a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where I come from. Is uh, I find it quite interesting. I still keep up to date, especially cognitive psychology, because my main uh, uh, work, actual work, is in uh, academic um, uh, teaching, writing, and um, um, linguist, language related uh, okay. business. So I, I do keep up to date on it. So, so if you talk to a person in general who doesn't have a sense of this, one of the things that I find though is, is the resistance to the concept of psychology being meaningful in the mm-hmm. place is that it's usually coming from a person who has never really contemplated themselves, right? Much, right? So, 
we all behave in, 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 in ways every day. We have to interact, we have to go to work, we have to do these things. And then, but if you sit back and you start to look at the behavioral pattern that you're engaging in in various ways, you start to build up this like, oh, I can sort of understand why this connects to that. Why did I respond to this thing? You start to map it out more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, as I said, I've read Jordan Peterson's book, mm -hmm. to me, and like this concept of using a map makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. to me. You were just mentioning it too. Yeah. The idea of the mind having an anatomy of sorts, right. and you're trying to, because what I don't understand is like, I'm, in terms of a person who isn't interested in this, is I want to know who I am, like what I am, and what I'm about, and mm -hmm. life, and it's, this, it's self understanding ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of people that say have uh, struggle with anxiety, let's say, as an example. Right. Um, there's no methodology that I know of that can just turn it off like a light switch. Mm -hmm. You have to engage with trying to figure out what's going on, what's causing these responses, and mm -hmm. then you get into like, oh, I have this ba a behavior pattern, I have this impulse to do these things. Mm -hmm. Where are they coming from? This is all, to me, useful as mm -hmm. an individual. Right, so, right. So that sort of comes into play, but um, because you're talking to me, when I hear depth psychology, mm -hmm. it's not just like um, basic sort of different kinds of responses, that anxiety response or fear mm -hmm. response or whatever, but it's this idea that there's these threads that weave into all of history that are the framework of how humanity as a whole sees itself and mm -hmm. moves. Because right. you, you talk about these really interesting stories uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. and they frame the culture, they frame the people, mm -hmm. they give the people a sense of meaning and purpose in life, mm -hmm. and, and they're organically grassroots developed, right? Mm -hmm. They're not, as you said, from the top down. Right. And so, we still live lives that have that relevancy mm -hmm. if we don't engage consciously mm -hmm. knowing that. Right. And um, um, yeah, so, so maybe a little bit on like, we can talk about the history of like how that type of thinking evolved. You mm -hmm. mentioned Young a few times. Yeah. And you, Joseph Campbell, right. who um, I really loved his book, The yeah. Savior of Us Pages. But yeah, uh, can you sort of speak to like how that might make sense to someone who's never really heard that before? That type right, of right, sure, sure. Okay, so yeah. Um, so let's just talk about the West for a little while then. So in the West, um, you had the um, Reformation, the Enlightenment, um, and what all this did is it brought a, a sense of progress to society that we could uh, advance, as we talked about earlier, science, uh, sciences, the technology, uh, and science and technology, its early success was then applied to society itself mm -hmm. how can we make societies better uh, you might your, your audience might know the, the progressive concept that we can make society better all the time it's, it's woven into who we are now mm -hmm. and that's we it's in our current form we cannot get away from the idea that we are constantly progressing in as a society to a an away away from something mm -hmm. what are we going away from mm -hmm. and a lot of that is has to do with leaving the idea, leaving the unconscious behind, and and the way that's framed in depth psychology uh, comes as a response in the Romantics originally, the, the German Romantics, um, Goethe and all of the, the great writers of the early German movements. Mm -hmm. Then, um, of course, I, I'm interested in Nietzsche. Nietzsche brought it, brought it to a, a higher degree, an analysis of. The inner workings of the mind, uh, the great, <clears throat> the great uh, um, depth psychologist uh, Sigmund Freud was a, was a he followed and used Nietzsche's ideas, and then Car and Gustav, uh, uh, well C.G. Young, Carl Gustav Young mm -hmm. uh, was the student of Freud. So basically, you had Nietzsche, Freud, mm -hmm. Jung, and Jung's where I was. I, I really f decided I wanted to 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 consider. Yeah. So what did he say? So what he says is that uh, it's, it's, you can't have it without the romantics and without Nietzsche. And it, even though you don't, most people don't like Freud anymore and his, his arguments were, were, were problematic. But the idea that um, the mind that we have, the psyche that we have, has had, has had a lot of pressure on it to form into certain societal structures. More so than uh, in the past in the, in the West, mm -hmm. for sure. But it's formed in this way so that there's this, and all hu all human beings have these these organs. The the organs they talk about the organs, and they have something called the ego. Mm -hmm. In German, that just means I, the who I am. Mm -hmm. So that's the the first idea. This ego that we've 
formed. It's not the ego of common parlance. Mm -hmm. Oh, he has a big ego or anything like that. The ego is the concept of who you are consciously in this society. Yeah. And you have to have many of the um, parts of society integrated into that ego. So you can have a persona. We also talk about the persona, which can change from particular situations. Maybe with your wife is different from your workmates, which is different from your sports team. Uh, that persona is very thin and, and superficial to a certain extent. But the ego is you. Yeah. And it's the, what we might call consciousness sure. in, in depth psychology. So there's this idea of the ego as what you see yourself as, you, who you are. Right. So that's where, that's where you, you go. So you go there first and you say, wait a second. Okay, so if this is who I think I am, is it all that I am? Mm. And that's the question that uh, depth psychologists want to argue mm. about. Is the ego everything? Mm -hmm. And um, the answer, of course, is no. <laughs> right. So, so what they're saying is that the, what has happened to us is that the ego has been more and more isolated from mm. what we really are. Mm. So what we've been born with. So where the cognitive psychologists would focus more on language and how we form our are uh, more the higher higher faculties of the mind. The depth psychologist is talking more about what you're talking about, the idea of who am I, what am I, what am I here? I'm not just talking about how I think about particular you know, ideas or why this particular language structure works. And the other, this that's the cognitive psychology. But depth psychology really wants to know who am I? What is this ego and what is this relationship to who we are? Yeah. So, so, so that's interesting because you said something that there that I hadn't heard before necessarily. I'm curious to know what, what you mean by that is that there's a movement away from the unconscious as, yeah. as a, and that correlates to the Western Enlightenment roughly and, and especially in the sense, I guess, of materialization of like, like materialized thinking about things as only material and not giving it any more spiritual um, quality. And I, I find that interesting because I know Nietzsche talked about, you know, God is dead and we need to kill them. Not as a good thing. Yeah, um, absolutely not. Yeah. And and so when you talk about the mind in the terms of the context of the psychology, uh, I hear a lot of stuff that could be pulled into older belief systems concept of the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, is that an evolution that makes sense to you? In that sense, is it is it is it an evolution of the same thing, or is it a different thing altogether? Like, yeah. The evolution of the spirit from spirit to like the mind. Like where does that where does that shift? I guess, but also, as you said, you're moving away from the unconscious. Why and how and what does that mean in terms of the play out? Right. Well, the spirit we could talk about later. That's that's um, a, a, an element uh, of. Yeah, it's very important. So we'll come back to the spirit. Uh, the just in terms of the evolution is what 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 a depth psychologists want to say is that um, as you are forced into certain circumstances to behave in certain ways. So very simply, when you're a child, you can't, you have to give up the diaper eventually, right? So, yeah. so, so eventually there's that. And yeah. Freud made a lot about that issue, but that's not a, a major issue. Right. But as we develop and we, uh, we separate ourselves from certain elements when we're, so for, for example, if I was a young person and, um, so I know this one person who's he's kind of an alcoholic, for example, this one guy I know. And he uh, he had tra trauma when he was younger and mm -hmm. just just it wasn't related to drinking or anything. It was just it wasn't violence. It was just this this thing happened that he, that really made him gave him a sense. He, he couldn't calm down. Mm -hmm. He couldn't calm down. He had trouble calming down and he needed he got nervous all the time. And when he got nervous, he could take a drink or a smoke or something. These behaviors developed and if you asked him now why do you smoke he can't tell you it's related to this or that yeah. um i know him well enough to to to, to be able to make but i'm not going to get involved yeah. we'll get back to that as well but but the idea is that so for example throughout your life you have a relationship with older women your mother your grandmother uh, people in the neighborhood and what jung is saying is that uh, the ego consciousness has a relationship with a, what he calls the complexes. Mm -hmm. The mother, and not, again, the, the common language here, you have a complex, this com it's, it's a real thing that we all have. They're organs of the mind. Mm -hmm. So mother complex, 
a father complex and it can be health, comparatively healthy mm-hmm. or unhealthy. And the healthy relationship is the ego's relationship to who you think you are and what your relationship is with your mother. And not exactly your mother, but mother figures. So that's what he's saying. There's that, that we're being given that, just like the kidney has been given its functions yeah, to yeah. do particular, yeah. to, to perform certain things. Yeah. The mind is an organ that is was given to us in evolution to perform certain tasks, to be able to relate with other people in a complex human way, mm-hmm. different from other animals. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sense is that the human mind must relate in particular complex ways. So in the past, we would have a continuing relationship with one or two, a small group of people. Yeah. Our, we were, humans were born to be in no less than, or no more than 40 to 60, yeah. uh, the number changes, but we're not meant to be in these massive yeah. complex societies. But we have to deal with all sorts of people and we develop these relationships with different people, but we don't have a strong, for example, episodic memory. Mm. We, we have a very symbolic mm-hmm. memory. Mm-hmm. So we remember, we don't remember particular instances very clearly. Of course we do. We have those occasional episodes, the so-called flashbulb memories, right? Yeah. But we remember in symbolic ways. Yeah. So they're all connected and linked into a particular complex in a relationship that the ego has. So you said when somebody comes up to you, so a, a mother figure type, an older woman might come up to you and approach you and you, you, the way you respond to that person, this is activated because you don't know that person. Yeah. You don't know anything about that person. So you're projecting the key word yeah, in, yeah. so in depth psychology talks about projection. Okay. So, and not, not in a negative way. It's, you have to, yeah, yeah, you yeah. have to, cause yeah. you don't know this. You have to try and have, yeah. try and develop a relationship with that person and trying to figure them out. Are they dangerous? Are they, what, what's going on? So you project yeah. onto them, yeah. but the only thing you can project on them is from that complex. Yeah. So you might have, if you have an unhealthy relationship with people of that sort, mm-hmm. it, it won't start out very well. I mean, you may get to know the person better and it, it could work out. That, that's interesting. Um, and and it, it speaks to the, the very, very key thing we, you know, that underlies all this, which is that you, know, you have organs, like you said, and physical organs. You don't get to choose whether you have a liver or not. Yeah. You, know, you don't get to choose whether or not you have these behavioral patterns that are right. inherently part of just being alive. Right. And then again, I'm interesting you brought up projection because I think that's a big part of so much of what's going on. Oh, right. I want you, I want to still dissect this a little bit more and it's just because I have a real fascination with this. Hmm. Um, like the idea of the ego being this part of you that can self-identify. So yeah. I am a thing and I know I'm different than this thing right. and now I'm different than you. Right. But that becomes pathological to me when you get my narcissism out of it, right? Yeah. So I start to think that I am the only thing Mm. And then I start to, not literally, but you know, figuratively, yeah. start to behave as if I don't have any concern about anything else. Right. And then that is in balance and that right. doesn't work. So I have to know I am a thing, mm-hmm. but I have to know how as a thing in the world, I am interact and integrate with the greater world. Mm-hmm. So this, and to me, some part of the unconscious is more attuned to that. Mm-hmm. At least what I would consider to be unconscious. Right. So I don't intuitively like the idea of pulling away from the unconscious to me it's more like i want the conscious and unconscious to become more harmonized right right does that that make sense well um yeah in um we'll we'll talk about the collect the collective unconscious so jung of course talks about the uh this universal organ that we inherit as well the the collective unconsciousness Mm. and and from that um we receive the ability we receive the organs the 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 different complexes and so if we're going to talk about, we'll talk about that later perhaps, but you, you mentioned the idea of the relationship between consciousness and unconsciousness. Uh, Jungian psychology talks about individuation. Yes. So it's an individu- individuating process that we must go through, but uh, many people don't. Yeah, so um, I, I, yeah, could you, could you, I, I want to bring this up one more time, just to really sort of get my head wrapped around this concept. Yeah. I, I still don't quite understand what you meant by the idea of pulling away from the unconscious as part of the European sort of um, 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 renaissance or the European um, Right. Can you, can you try to clarify that? Right? Sure. Yeah. You mentioned about uh, spirituality and that's the, the primary focus. Um, so, for example, in uh, the Christian tradition, there are, are so many ways of understanding who you are. Sure. So you are, um, for example, 
this particular person within your relationship with God. Okay, so there's a God, um, uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, um, West, uh, but every tradition has that. Um, in Japan, of course, with the, with the Shinto and, and of course the Kami that I talk about. And um, every, every religion has a sense that there is a relationship with a particular God. Mm -hmm. And that God is a deep part of the human mind that cannot be avoided. You cannot stop from uh, being grounded in something like mm -hmm. that. So you need to have a belief in a higher being, a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. So most religions come with a sense of purpose. So, for example, in the, in the West, in the Christian tradition, the idea of the Trinity or the incarnation so that you are uh, born with, a, with grace, a piece of grace in your soul, yeah, yeah. so to speak. So your soul, you already have that and you are from that, you have grace already and you, your, purpose, your purpose is to work to become closer to God, right. to, in, to, to, to become, uh, to just to move towards God, to do good things, to do so there's a, there's, a, there's a and there's a lot of complex ways within different co communities and of how that's performed. So there are certain rituals that are uh, that turn on certain parts of the brain yeah. that uh, you you just you know, open and react and act in certain ways. And it it's these rituals touch the unconscious. They are linked to the yeah. unconscious. Yeah, yeah. So that's the the point is that you're linked to the unconscious. Okay. And when we talk a little bit later, because you can't talk about young without talking about dreaming. So, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. So, how do we, how how do we hold the connection to uh -huh. to uh, the unconscious? So, what the modern West has done in the death of God, as Nietzsche proclaimed it. Nietzsche wasn't the first to say that God was dead. He was the one who just proclaimed it uh, as Zarathustra, uh, the raging mm. God is dead. God is dead in in the great uh, great uh, tomb that. Uh, that home that he had written yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so the god is dead but the the idea of god is dead is that uh we've cut off ourselves with from the unconscious so a lot of the senses that we a lot of our spirituality comes from our from our unconscious relationship oh is that me <laughs> that was a great thread that you were talking about right. and so what it sounds to me like what you're leaning towards is this idea that by disconnecting from the spiritual was, is, is also sim, sim, simultaneously disconnecting from our ability to connect into the unconscious that the right. rituals provided in that context. Right. Is that, is that true? Enough? You're right. So, so when you're in a dream and there's a character, the dreaming character, and what Jung says is that dreaming character is the ego. Uh -huh. The ego consciousness uh, drops into the unconscious. In fact, in his, uh, some of his greatest works is he talks about his own experiences. Where he he's he's in a particular place could be just like this. Then the door the floor opens up and he falls into a cave and he's in the cave and in the cave there are certain characters, certain uh, living beings, uh, an old man, a child. These sorts of characters are there. So the idea is that the ego consciousness. What we've done is we've built the floor, so to speak. So there's there's we're not related to that. So when when you're in the past, what Jung says is the way the human mind was built is that when you fall asleep or you go into a fantasy or daydream, you move into the unconscious, the ego, because the ego always exists, has always existed, always will exist. Uh, in, um, except, of course, in psychotic. There's, that's another issue because he was a psychiatrist, right? But when they lose control. But, so you move into the unconscious and you have a relationship with the unconscious. And that is the, that was mitigated and, and controlled and organized by spiritual experience yeah. so that the the what you experience the 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 uncanniness of the people and the other characters or the pr presence of something like like for example he talks about when we're talking about the spirit uh he talks he records a, a dream from one of his patients and in that particular dream the man was walking in the mountains in Switzerland and he walked down into the valley towards a, a cold lake mm -hmm. and in the past in his dreams he was never able to get to that point mm -hmm. he was always blocked somehow by diff this and that sort of uh, event but this time on this particular time this because he woke up with this dream he had to have it analyzed mm -hmm. he made it to the lake 
and it was a cold, beautiful lake. It was twilight, a little bit of a mysterious time, and all of a sudden he felt this cold breeze. Something was coming across the lake, across its surface, coming at him, and he woke up in a storm. Huh. And uh, Jung would say that's the spirit. Huh. The spirit is the essence of what we've lost. Mm. So he could never make it there. And when he does finally make it there in the dream, it's an uncanny place. It's, it's a, and there's a, there's a presence there. Mm. So that presence is something that in the past humans always experienced. And then they would wake up and dream telling was very common in, in the past. Yeah. You'd wake up and you'd tell your wife or your husband what uh, you, you dream. You'd sit together and you'd analyze it. It might come up in uh, particular spiritual rituals. I had this dream. Mm. There was never, it was never cut off. We were never cut off from the unconscious. We were, the unconscious lived in society. Yeah. And it still does in, uh, when, you, when you analyze um, societies, more, more small scale societies, they yeah. still, there's still that sort of, of uh, relationship between the unconscious experiences that we have every night and um, in our, also in our fantasies in our images, when we are walk, even when we're, for example, just walking alone or to say, for example, if we were on a hunting party, just you and me walking through the, this dark, you know, forest and we hear something and we're wondering what, what that is. There's a sense of our unconscious is trying to comprehend it as well. Yeah, yeah. It's not just the ego conscious. Yeah. It's not just us with our, I think it's, you know, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. there's a sense. Yeah. So you feel something. You feel nervous. You feel an uncanny presence. Yeah. And that's the unconscious relating. And you're not aware of it. When, and for us, it's very difficult for us to... to we, we are aware of being afraid or un, something's uncanny or something strange. And especially when you wake up from a dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the issue. They, we, are, we cut ourselves off. So we say, oh, it's just... Oh, just a dream. Yeah. It's nothing. Or we forget it. Most people just forget their dreams. Yeah, and that's, that's connected to, I think... At least somewhat connected to how people, if you bring up general psychological concepts in any way, they often kind of just have that shut off, you know, right. switch. And so, definitely, if you try to talk to people about dream symbology, they're going to be like, wow, I don't want to think about that. Yeah. But they're, they're missing this rich connection that this starts, right. as you said. Right. And it, it brings, it, like, this is one of the things that I think about a lot in my life. Just about, I've been trying to figure out, like, why did the ego, like, evolve the way it did? And what is the ultimate purpose of that relationship to this unconscious because my unconscious still is me mm -hmm. so my egos views it somehow as if it isn't yeah in a way and that's really weird right to me yeah, yeah. you know and at the same and, and i also notice that with a lot of people um i'm not necessarily prone to this although but i am is um it's a fearful of the unconscious oh yeah and well, like, why are you afraid of yourself like that's a weird thing to me like how mm -hmm. that came to be but do you, is, is deep depth psychology, is that, is, is there a conscious, is there an attempt within that to, to integrate those things? Is that the aim? Yeah. Well, first of all, it, the container of religion gave us, was, was wide enough, strong enough, and, uh, you know, collective enough, the group would work, work with you together uh, to contain the fear. Mm -hmm. So we had that. So we don't no longer have that because we, nobody believes in the unconscious. Uh, in, in we, we think that everything has to be touched. Everything has to be scientifically proven. Everything, yeah. there's no spirits, there's no gods, there's no unconscious. A lot of people, we've been forced fed that. Yeah. And uh, so that's a problem for, for, for people because then that's how you, there's so much neurosis, yeah. so much, as you said, anxiety and all of these develop. And, and we can go into that later, uh, how they develop. But the most important point that you mentioned is what is the depth psychology? What is their purpose, right? So, uh, well, uh, what is it? Uh, Jung said um, individuation. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of it? Individuation is a natural process that um, we would go through without conscious thinking uh, in the older days. We would mm -hmm. develop in particular ways, you know, defined by help, help in ways defined by a particular culture or religion or whatever. Uh, but the unconscious would be, part, it would be a major part of that. But we don't have that. So what um, Jeff Psychology says, and the, their answer uh, is on many levels. One of the answers is, of course, dream analysis. So when you wake, so I went through one course um, uh, with a doc, Dr. Odanyik. He died. He, he passed away about five or six years ago. He's a great uh, 
was a great teacher. He taught, um, he originally was teaching at Columbia University in economics. And, and he told the story t um, in the interview for me, for, for, for the program. Uh, he said, I was this quite famous, uh, he, quite famous uh, writer on uh, a particular political or political economic issue in Eastern Europe or Western Europe or somewhere. And he said, I was doing this and every day I'd, I'd go to teach and uh, I'd, I couldn't get into the classroom without drinking a couple of glasses of whiskey. He mm. just, I just couldn't do it. Mm. I'd gotten to that point where I was stuck. I was lost. And that's when he gave, gave up that teaching and went to study Jung, became a Jungian psychologist. And, mm -hmm. and he had several dreams. And, uh, you know, I'll talk about those dreams later. But more importantly, what he, he, he taught the class, a dream analysis class. And what, what the, the, the approach to doing that is, say you, you wake up, but you must wake up at the same time every day, for example, 7 a.m., 6 a.m. Sure. And you wake up. And the first time you wake up, you're going to remember something. Even though you, most people, a lot of people say, I never dream. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for you not to dream. Right, right. Right. So, right. so you get up and you write what you remember. It won't be very much. Yeah. It just won't be very much because there's, you don't, it's, it's, it just disappears yeah. quickly, right? But after about a week or two of doing that, you start to remember more and more and more. And you, because it's, it's, it's like a discipline. Mm -hmm. So you wake up and you meditate on it. You don't just sit there and go oh, oh this was great you write down what you can bits and pieces of it and he recommended we had to do art projects for example mm -hmm. how to analyze this how to focus on this and then what he, what he did and this is what this is ancient knowledge by the way this is not mars he went back you go back and you meditate it's called it's called active imagination okay. it's a Jungian term where they the ego goes into the dreaming world mm -hmm. And the dreaming world is still active because mm -hmm. you're still in that state and you, but you're conscious okay. and now you can interact with the characters in the dream. Mm -hmm. It's like a fantasy, but the, the unconscious is active. Yeah. yeah. And I've done this now and it, it, it's scary. So yeah. you're saying, well, are people afraid? Why are they afraid? They should be afraid. Yeah. It's, it's quite scary. In fact, they don't recommend just people just doing it by themselves and just, okay. so this is something that, um, is very, it's quite disturbing because when you, your, your ego has a sense of who you are. Yeah. And if you know that all the characters in there are facets of yourself, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And facets of human society since the beginning of time. Yeah. Uh, this person, who become, it becomes like a person, like a dream. There's this character and it approaches you. And it's not, it's, you, you have a sense that it's part of you, but it's not at all at the, under the will yeah. of the ego. Yeah, yeah. And that's what Jung says is the problem is that we think the ego should be in control of everything. Ah, so, ah, ah, ah. Serious, so that's the problem. So that relationship between the ego and the unconscious, it's, right. a, it's a critical relationship mm. because as far as I understand it, if a person is totally detached from their unconscious, they become psychotic. Yeah. Uh, because there's no thing to ground them mm -hmm. in the greater world. But I, as I said, I'm really fascinated with the idea that the ego becomes afraid of the unconscious when it comes at it. Because, mm -hmm. well, I, as I said, I don't have an answer for why exactly, but I have mm -hmm. some, some speculation. Right, sure, sure. Yeah. And, and one of them is that um, is that this idea of rebirth is really important throughout your life. You mm -hmm. need to ritually be reborn. Right. You need to become an adult. You need to become a father. You need to become whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, like, like the Christ Jim concept of being reborn is like the most potent version of that story in some ways. Yeah. And um, um, there's this thought, and this I, I get this from like shamanistic traditions, I think, is because they often have the experience of a death within their ritual right. use of psychedelics and this kind of thing. And that when you do that, though, then you can become reborn, so to speak, as being more greater development of who you are. Maybe that's related to your situation or yeah. something. But, um, so, so I had this experience once because for a period of about five years in my early 30s, I was invited to participate in ayahuasca circles. Oh, what? Ayahuasca. You know what that is? No, I don't. Okay, so um, ayahuasca is um, a brew that's cooked up by shamans in the South America. Oh, okay, okay. Right? And it's, it's the most potent and long-lasting psychedelic you can take. 
take. Right, right. And it's always, it should always be given within a ritualized setting where right. people know what they're doing. And I don't support in any way people playing with it. It's not a game. Yeah. It's, not, it's not even fun to a certain degree. Yeah. But um, I had some pretty interesting experiences. And right. one of them was, you know, a dreamscape vision. So it doesn't have to make any sense in physical reality. Yeah. But it's like somehow there is this sphere that represented conscious day-to-day -day mind. Yeah. And then somehow there is this sphere that represented totality of the unconscious right. and that is like a you could say it's like all knowing but only because it isn't specifically dividing anything it's just right. everything is connected right and what i was doing was taking this sphere trying to push it into this sphere uh. and it wouldn't work because every time this came into the, this the, the conscious sphere came into the, the, the totality sphere right. eventually the pressure from the unconscious would crack the conscious sphere into little shards of glass kind of oh, oh, yeah. and then it would reform again yeah. and then I just kept trying this and, yeah. <laughs> and, but I had this instinct that I wanted to take my consciousness mm. and integrate it into that mm. um, and, and even that I can't explain, I don't know why that was yeah. what I was driven to do but I can't imagine that well obviously we can't dis disconnect ourselves from our unconscious into a good end mm. that, that has to be refitted Right. <clears throat> so do you think that, like, how would you, how would, how would you approach it from that, the depth psychology perspective of, like, how would you deal with that, um, that struggle? Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so for example, in the uh, individuation process, uh, it's, it's about being, about actually trying to find a relationship between the conscious and unconscious yeah. mind. So it's 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 not being integrated actually. So of course when you're you know there's a there's a, a drive to, to want to be completely integrated with the unconscious, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to develop a stronger uh, conscious mind that is more integrated, and more linked, mm -hmm. uh, supported, and and in in many ways, uh, how do we say like a stronger relationship with the unconscious. So when you're separate from the unconscious, you're uh, ego becomes easily uh, so. For example, if you're afraid of the unconscious when you're un, when you're um, in your dreaming state, you're also in a lot of neuro neuroses and, mm -hmm. and and anxiety is a fear of the world itself. Yeah, yeah. So what we would have a, a, a someone with a good relationship with the unconscious would have uh, a sense of 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 stability. You see what I mean? Not afraid or not nervous about different things we talked about the person who was drinking too much and mm -hmm. they didn't have a relationship with that concept yeah. so what would what would someone do so for example um uh here's a here's a dream from um a book a, a, a little little book on dreams or something yeah it's, it's a little blue book i've got it still it's just one of my favorite books and he has he gives some examples and uh, one, one of the examples was a woman who had this uh dream about um, she's a nurse and she had this vivid dream a lucid dream and she woke up and she couldn't get it out of her mind so what was the situation was was that uh, she was in a hospital in her hospital but the lights was everything was dark except for the light at her uh, her particular um, at the place with the nurse the nursing sta okay. station okay. and she was alone and then she went out on her, and she's in her dream, so she went out on her, uh, you know, basically her rounds. Sure. But the hallways were all dark. Mm -hmm. And she walked and she opened the doors. And then she came to one door, and the, she opened the door, and she went in. And there was a woman, uh, an elderly woman, with facing the, away from her, kind of in the dark, still quite shadowy. And there was a sense of, of fear mm. and she woke up mm. so what the union psychologist did with with her in that situation she went back and engaged in uh, active imagination so he said okay relax and you know she just went through the procedures of just relaxing allowing her consciousness to to weaken and so then she was still conscious was still awake and the dream was there, so he said, okay, go back to the station, imagine the station again at the beginning of the dream, and walk out, so she did. She went through the same process. She went down the same hallway, and she went to the door, and he was asking her, what do you see? And so he, what he wanted to know is what she 
did not notice. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. What about the dream that she didn't notice? Okay. So what's this? What's that? What's this look like? What's this feeling? Mm. And so when she got to the door, she says, okay, stop. Don't open it yet. What does the door look like? Mm. And she described the door and it was an ancient door, mm. like from an old farmhouse from 200 years ago. Mm. It was not a, at all. Mm. And she was shocked by that. And she actually woke back up and surprised her and they talked about the emotional aspect of that right so what does that mean he cannot it's, again Jungian psychology is not top down so they could all all that you know if you're doing it with a friend for example and this is the way it was in ancient times ancient ancient uh, knowledge you wouldn't say this means this this means this this means this it's what do you feel what mm -hmm. does that remind you of what so they're trying to so in terms of a process they're trying to say what did you not notice and why mm -hmm. okay and what do you feel about it what do you think about it and you think it through yourself so that's the analysis part so no no top down this is what it is yeah, so cool. accept it go do it <laughs> it's it's more like what do you think it so it's a, it's a, that's why individuation the individual individuation process is an active process yeah you have to engage yeah. you have to do it you see, I mean, it's not a passive thing. You can't be afraid. You can't move away. So you have to say, well, what does, what is, why is this like this? And so that will inform later. Uh, in So she continued for in this particular case. She continues into the room. Okay. Still dark. The woman's still there. She gets closer. She sees this massive purple bruise on the back, on the neck. Mm. She had not seen that before. Mm. So again, they stopped and they, they talked about, okay, what does that mean? And she was afraid of it. She was, she, it took time to calm down and she went back in. And then she reached out in the dream. The ego touched mm -hmm. that and the woman turned around and the face was, of, uh, they describe it as sad, a great sadness. Or, mm -hmm. And it was this elderly woman. So, And there's something, that he doesn't explain because it's privacy. So he didn't explain what came from that. But okay. something came from that. There was some kind of deep meaning for her sure. about some elderly woman who might have been abused or yeah. something like that but it, it's not that that happened it's just that she had hidden it yeah. Yeah. and she had not uh, dealt with it yeah and, and my understanding is that the unconscious speaks more of symbolically than it does literally with yeah. words right so the image is what matters in the sense of what that pertains to you as like it could be a whole download of information right. just from a single image um I, I'm really curious, like, I'm, I've decided to uh, pursue more medicine studies in my life, so I'm oh, going to start by getting certified to do acupuncture for people and right. help your broadcast and all this. Right. But um, um, one of the study things I want to focus in on is uh, helping people with trauma. Because like, trauma is a really interesting phenomenon, mm -hmm. and it's really uniquely human in some ways, at least yeah. the way humans express it, because, mm -hmm. like, this is coming from one of my teachers, he always says this, but it's a yeah. lesson, it's like, you know, wilderness let's say right um, yeah gets attacked by a lion stress levels go through the roof mm. but it escapes mm. and then it's going back to eat the grass mm. and five minutes later his metabolism is back down to normal and everything's mm. fine because it's not holding on to that traumatized memory at right that moment. but human beings get stuck with these for like ever sometimes right, right? Yeah. but i think of the ego is like look that the thing the ego does and i'm just speculating on my own self but mm. the thing the ego does where it's terrified to some degree especially with certain people of mm. the oncoming power of the unconscious yeah. in that space it's like it's becoming traumatized by itself somehow yeah and um like i, I always wonder like, how did that happen that we we we, we had this consciousness emerge into our our species mm -hmm. and then it has this weird ambivalent relationship with the unconscious right, yeah. and then it also like to me the unconscious in a lot of ways represents nature as a whole yeah yes. which is the infinite unknown potentiality of things mm. And the ego's terrified of that. Mm -hmm. Is it just because it knows it's going to die at some point eventually, or is it? Is there something like wired in there that maybe the ego was born out of the trauma of self-identification or mm -hmm. something? Or it, it, I don't know where to go with it necessarily, mm -hmm. but I speculate on that one. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, it still could be uh, as a, like the enlightenment, the idea that uh, we we killed the god, that our own god. When he, when Nietzsche says. God is dead. He means the, the Western God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So he, he's just talking about how we have destroyed mm -hmm. our relationship with our spiritual relationship with a greater being. 
so a something that's greater than us and the, the unconscious the unconscious can in many ways uh, be multifaceted yeah. uh, of course and it's, it's, it's just it's just beyond us beyond our knowledge and our control so to 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 religion allows us in many ways to say there is this thing that's beyond us yeah. and what what it is we don't know yeah. but the enlightenment says we know uh, we know that this doesn't exist we know that you're going to die and it's going to be terrible and uh, life is not something worth having even sometimes and so so there's that sense you're you're in a you're working in an office and you're wake up and you're 30 like 35 years old and you haven't got a, a relationship with a, a significant other or you've got no children you've got no you, you don't even talk to your parents or you're there's all these things and you, you're, you're, your ego may not be realizing it but it the unconscious is realizing so the yeah. ego's unrelated so you might not be consciously saying oh i wish i could talk to my dad again or my mom again or i wish i had had some kids or i wish i had fallen in love or something these things I'm, I'm here working in this cubicle and i think that this is all there is mm -hmm. because they told me to mm -hmm. just work here and then uh, you know that's the that's what a real man is or a real woman is and it's it's, it's been it's disassociated with what yeah. we uh, what our true psyche requires we need yeah. that relationship with other peoples but also with a greater being yeah we need it and that's and so we don't have that relationship so when it comes to us mm. and we don't we're not ready for it we're we're freaked out yeah. because it comes in dreams a lot of people i know that don't believe in any of this they they because they know i've studied psychology say i just weird dream uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going eh, you know <laughs> okay <laughs> it scared me or or they'll they just they're, they're, the anxiety that's in there is because it's not there's there's a sense that there's nothing there, but they know there is something there, and that yeah. there, there's there's a disconnect. Yeah. So there's that's the problem, and the individuation process that psychology says the only way to get beyond that is to reconnect with the unconscious and to reconnect with the great. So you may not believe in the Christian God, or you may not believe in the, the Shinto way, but you must find a way, mm -hmm. and um, that's what Jung thought that we had to do. That was our our mission in the modern world is. To find a different way because our old traditions are have gone the traditions were ways of finding peace in the world yeah. and that if you look at all the traditions they have a way of you relating to other things uh, not just that greater being but all the things of society and culture so now we have we produce meat and vegetables and, and we get we get fruits from mexico and it's we know if you if you we we, we taste it it doesn't taste anything like what it, a, na a real natural, say tomato for example. You eat a tomato in, in Vancouver in the winter. It's like a cardboard, right? Mm -hmm. So you you kind of eat it. You kind of think I'm, I'm eating tomato, but it's not. And you're even something simple like that. There's a sense that there's something wrong, and yeah. you you know it, but it's not. Yeah. So something knows it, yeah. but it's not the ego that knows it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in this dynamic of this sort of push and pull between the ego and the unconscious and everything um, if the aim is towards what's, what you're calling individuation mm. that sounds a lot like an integration essentially a, a balancing um, and then the person can be at peace essentially like, right. is, is that kind of where that wants to land is, because because like, to me it, it, my understanding is if a, if a person's ego is totally disconnected from their unconscious they're never going to be happy right so ha and happiness is probably not the best word but yeah but if they're going to have a fulfillment in their life, it has you have to integrate. It, right. It, it, that, that makes sense to you? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, it's it's not just happiness, though. I, I think it's a more active um, yeah, process. It's, it's not the best word. Because yeah, it's, it's I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it's happy is just a yeah. It's become too general, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. But yeah, no. I think uh, so. For example, uh, we talked about um, uh, behaviors or um, states that are um, not not something that we, sh we we should continue having so if we're you know everybody likes to go have maybe have a drink or something but to to, to drink until you fall down mm -hmm. uh to um to uh, be too afraid mm -hmm. you know like like we have hypochondriacs in our modern world a lot right so people are afraid of everything mm -hmm. uh, these behaviors are destructive to our sense of who we are and we can't really feel uh, that we've we've developed yeah. so it's not really like I have to go to the hospital, but it's 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 
it should be something that we do ourselves, right? It should be something that we can say, okay, I've got this problem and I want to analyze this. I want to think about it. So the goal would be to try and find a relationship with the unconscious, that things that have been, been cut off. So the unconscious is trying to get in touch with us. So it's a kind of a weird way of saying it, but mm -hmm. the, the, through dreams, through behaviors, because mm -hmm. your, your urge, you said about, you mentioned about urges and motivation. You're doing things, but you don't know why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So the ego consciousness the ego doesn't know why it's doing this. So if you ask someone, why do you do that? It's destructive. And they say, oh, I don't know, man, I just, I like it. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's not really true, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. So the person could do without, um, say, smoking too much, for example. My my uh, my, father, my mother died of, of smoking and she couldn't quit. She was a nurse too. So I mean, she, she died of, of lung cancer and... Uh, so what, all, all my life I asked, why, why do you do that? She said, I got to do this. I got to do this. And she didn't know why. No. So these sorts of things. I mean, she could continue and, you know, life is that way. And if she wants to do it, that's fine. But it, she didn't want to continue. You know what I mean? Yeah. She, she wanted to quit and she tried these patches. All, well, everything science told her to do. Right. Put this patch yeah, on, yeah. Uh, chew this gum yeah. or, you know, do these sorts of things. But it, it, none of it worked. And so what would work is her analyzing what... Why does she have the anxiety that requires this? Because yeah. it's you don't wake up and say, I just you could look at it from a scientific perspective. They say you've got uh, there's this addiction and it's a biochemical uh, situation, but it's not entirely that. There's something that is motivating you, something yeah. that you need to, uh, to, to. So, th so that's the, the, the break between science, scientific answers, and uh, depth psychological answers, where scientific is your passive, uh, you got to take this drug or that drug and everything will be fine but it's never fine yeah. right yeah. And so but from a from a deep perspective you must take charge and you must be in charge of connecting and understanding and analyzing why you have these destructive behaviors for sure so that's the, um yeah for sure um i think what's interesting about that and it, it, it comes to my mind anyways is, is um as i said i read that book by peterson um and he talks about uh, his interpretation of one of the oldest myths in, in humanity, in mm -hmm. history, which is the, uh, the epic, epic of Gilgamesh. Oh, yeah. And um, his take on it, and I thought it was a really interesting point. It relates to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you have this thing called your ego, mm -hmm. and it has this relationship to this greater thing called the unconscious, we're mm -hmm. calling it unconscious. Right. And as you said, you can enter into that, and you can. there's characters within that framework, mm -hmm. and then they become certain behavioral patterns seem to embody themselves within what's often called the archetypal yeah. thing. And so maybe you have the, like you said, the, the, the mother slash grandmother character, you have the father character. Right. But then you also get things that are more, more specialized, yeah. um, you know, particularly the warrior concept right. in that sense. And so in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Peterson compares all these different gods that exist yeah. at that time to these characters of behavior right. that are within most of people anyways. Right. But they're, and they're having this fight about who should lead mm. and it's because there's this great monster is coming mm. and this great monster sounds a lot like the unconscious pouring it basically. right right and they just have to decide who is going to lead mm. and they decide that uh, i think the name is uh marduk is the yeah marduk, um, marduk yeah. and i think and, and yeah so marduk um so but, but the reason that marduk gets chosen to be the leader is because he's the one who wants to go face the demon directly Mm. All the others want to kind of hide and and, mm. stand. and so they say, okay, you're the one that wants to go and embrace, it, 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 face the unknown, face right. the challenge. You get to be up front, right? And um, I, so you, so if a person is having anxiety problems or something, right, um, it's probably not the the hero archetype right. that's driving that behavior, and right? They could potentially work towards more of that into in, into their behavior. Personality, right, right, right. A little more of the, uh, yeah, the Marduk character, yeah. Yeah, and, and and I would I see a lot of the rituals that people use in traditional cultures as a way of kind of like encouraging that character to come out more, right? Because they're showing support in the community, and you can feel more comfortable with yourself yeah. this way. But then they're also embracing the fact that this exists. Yeah. I, you know, a lot of people in the, today's world would just deny that a lot of this even exists at all, right? Right. Yeah. Kind of close it off. The enlightenment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which is funny how that played out. But but yeah, so do you, do you agree with that concept then of like, if you're going to seek individuation, which is, as we established, is necessary for fulfillment in life, it has to be a, a heroic mindset in a sense that goes towards that? 
Yeah, well, I think, um, well, to start off, the, the Jung and depth psychology believes that the unconscious is fundamentally mythological. So that uh, myths of the past uh, came directly out of um, the, the telling of, of dreams and stories. So it very often we have this sense of this type of character, this type of character are interacting, but they come from our dreams and multiple tellings of similar dreams and similar situations. So the, the, the psyche, the mind itself, the unconscious is mythological. So mm. it doesn't just exist and like as like little lights flashing there they do form uh fundamental characters yeah. so those are the archetypes of the unconscious and they're 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 not formed into they're kind of like vaguely formed but they so they they can take on uh, iterate different iterations in different cultural elements but they're similar yeah. in that sense there's the hero yeah. so joseph campbell talked about the he, the hero with a thousand faces um he was uh, Sometimes Jungian, sometimes not Jungian, mm -hmm. but he he he's so he's a a great writer and he, he tells great he's a great storyteller. So when you talk about the hero, uh, is it the hero that must? Uh, it depends. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it depends on what you need. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have a a problem relationship with your mother or something like that, it might not be the hero that you need to deal with. You you need to develop a relationship with that sort of character. So um, very often Jung talked about, and Nietzsche, of course, the ancient Greeks. So in the Western culture, you have, uh, for example, Ares. Mm. So the, what the Greeks actually thought is that when you went into a fit of anger, Ares had possessed you. Yeah. So that's what they believed is that you had been possessed by the unconscious. Yeah. So, the, so the God wasn't... So we have this really cartoonish idea mm -hmm. of what past cultures believed yeah. that's what at the beginning we talk about images of reality we have no idea unless you study it really well yeah. what the greeks thought what they thought um for what people and nietzsche was an expert on that is that those gods possessed you from the unconscious mm -hmm. and from there weren't like sitting on clouds and mm -hmm. eating drinking mm -hmm. wine and and they, there was a sense where they just came in and possessed you so you got really angry and the god aries the, the god of war mm -hmm. uh, possessed you so you got angry or if you fell in love with someone you couldn't control ah uh, mm -hmm. that was that uh, was a um, aphrodite aphrodite, aphrodite, aphrodite yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah aphrodite had possessed you sure. you see what i mean so there was a, a sense that your ego had lost control yeah. and so that wasn't a good thing it wasn't a good thing. They didn't think that was a good thing. Sure. So they had to. It had to be mitigated because you didn't want a bunch of guys say, "Okay, Ares possessed me. That's why I killed those people." So it's okay, right? So it's yeah, so, so it it's there was a sense that that had to be that you had to have a relationship with all those characters. So not just the hero, but you had to have a strong relationship with how yeah. love or how mm. anger or war you had to be. You had to be in control. Yeah. So again, it's again, we're back to this idea of active. You're actively relating to those characters. For sure, for sure. Actually, um, one of my favorite books um, on on psychology in a general sense is um, James Hill. No, 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 no. Um, it's called The Terrible Love of War by James Hillman. Oh, Hillman. Yeah, yeah. And it's all I met Hillman. Oh, really? Several times, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, me. Yeah, 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 no, his book really influenced me. Yeah. And it was all about the relationship between Aries and Aphrodite. Right. And and what what that made made me think about though is like. There's the this cast of characters that represents mm. this kind of like collective unconscious behavioral patterns, and then there's still the ego. So there's still this thing that you are an individual mm -hmm. that has a relationship with a bunch of potential behavioral patterns, right? And the 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 individual that develops themselves, then I guess would be able to pick and choose what's appropriate for what, right? In what context, and and do so without losing themselves completely, right? into anger to whatever yeah so that so there's the place that makes sense for the ego to sit is, mm -hmm. is this you're still you somehow no matter what else is going mm -hmm. on in that mm -hmm. sense yeah yeah absolutely absolutely there's yeah there's you can use the energy or the 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 model of character that aries might be but you're in charge mm -hmm. you see that's a healthy individual mm -hmm. an unhealthy individual is is overwhelmed yeah. by anger yeah. 
or overwhelmed by love for someone. So maybe it's your best friend's girlfriend or something. You, I have to have her because <laughs> and you don't know why. Yeah. And so you're overwhelmed. Yeah. So there's that sense that there's something wrong when you cannot control these things. And, and these are just the major characters. But of course, anxiety is what's it related to? Many particular sources, many different characters. Mm -hmm. The archetype, potential archetypes are, are limitless, yeah. right? So, but yeah, it's, so that would be very, or Hermes, for example, you're very cunning and, mm -hmm. and, and creative and you, you need that sometimes, but you need to be in control of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you have to have a good relationship with that, the unconsciousness in that sense, that cunningness. Yeah. You don't want to be always like cutting, 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 because then you become, I mean, you, you, you lose, you block, anyway, you're not in control, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I, I, I've been told that um, uh, one of the influences for the concept of the archetypes that Jung came up with was the Chinese medicine model of the five elemental theory. Oh, really? And there's, so there's these five elements, and it's really, it's kind of interesting, I wish I could show, visually show you, but there's five of them, and sometimes you can put, you can put them in a circle, mm -hmm. and then each one creates and feeds the other in the circle mm -hmm. but if you connect them along a pentagram lines mm -hmm. across the circle they attack each other oh. and so there's this counterbalancing that always has to happen so right. you know not too much of this energy overwhelms this energy it's counterbalanced from this point right and then, right and ideally health is everything in balance right right, right. um but they do relate each of the elements um earth fire water air metal um not air. anyway those elements into behavioral traits right so, uh, interestingly, in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking to people over this, but um, the, the base one is water. Water is the base of life. Right. And it's a relationship between fear and self-determination, right. willpower. Yeah. So it's too much too much fear, and you know, you're not going to function. Yeah. But too much willpower without any fear, mm -hmm. you're going to be off the deep end right. in things. And, and, and so that, that constant dynamic back and forth, and the ego is the thing in the middle then that's, right. I guess, holding the reins. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't really studied much of the, the, the that well, uh, that aspect of the Jungian. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of getting at it's like I imagine. I'm just seeing if that makes sense to you in terms of you could, relating to the process of individuation in, in the Jungian context. It's it's a balance thing. It's it's, it's not going to be like you become this you know embrace this character and that's it. Yeah, yeah. it's an ongoing. Sure. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You would you would want to. For example, you mentioned the hero. The hero. So if you want to be the hero all the time, uh, I mean, you could be missing out on other elements. So you could be overwhelmed by other aspects. Yeah, yeah. So you need to have a relationship. I think Jung, not necessarily a relationship between different archetypes, but the ego has to have a relationship with all of these in in balance. Yeah. And then um, when to call upon it. So it's psychological. It's, it's like an organ, as we talked about earlier. An yeah. organ. You need that. You need to be able to to be a little bit more forceful in this situation. Someone who's always like afraid of talking or doing things, they they, they need that. Like yeah. they might need some sort of a, a sense of, of of the hero yeah. to, to to rise to something. Or you're afraid to do something. Right? Yeah. You should do this, but you don't want to do it uh, because and you're afraid. So yeah. Okay, so as I like to do with the podcast in general, right. so I like to come back to words things that. Um, positive for the future of mankind like towards a good end right yeah there's a lot of turmoil right now <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know to say the least yeah, yeah. And, and and so um i I'm, I'm i'm an eternal optimist and i always but basically my life is largely directed towards the greatest good i can conceive of in in, in many ways mm -hmm. um and so anyway um if in order to achieve individual to sustain peace as an individual individuation mm -hmm. is accomplished it has to be done through integration of the ego and the unconscious yeah that's sort of a premise that's been put down now yeah i would imagine that that has to be true to the collective as well in maybe in a different way but it, 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 the, the, the society we live in isn't going to be happy and at peace unless mm -hmm. there is a way for us individually and collectively to mm -hmm. integrate more in that sense right right and so what really stands out to me and i'm really impressed with is the more the story of of Amaretsu, the the sun goddess, Amaterasu, yeah, uh, yeah. Amaterasu, yeah. Amaterasu. Yeah. Um, although the other story is pretty cool too, yeah. but with her, it's because the sun, to me, being symbolic of like prosperous, happy, positive, mm -hmm. all those things, right. hides away, and then to get it to come back out again, mm -hmm. it's 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 like they create a 
they, 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 they celebrate. And, right. and then she wants to engage in the celebration. Right. It's not a forceful thing. It's not right. a war. Um, it's, it's, it's an embracing of, of something greater in a positive way, in that sense. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, how, how do we aim at that, uh, both individually and, and as a society as a whole, you know, what things can sort of maybe percolate towards that end. And one of the things I'm um, really, really watching carefully, I'm sure a lot of people are, is mm. there's a battle now going on between people that are calling themselves the trucker convoys, mm -hmm. and then this uh, Trudeau's government, mm -hmm. right, Canada, as a specific yeah. example. And if the trucker convoy falls away from being peaceful, Mm. and gets caught up in the desire to get violent or right. whatever else, mm. the whole thing's going to fall apart, and it's going right. to be ugly, ugly stuff. Right. But if they can hold on to positive, celebrative, celebratory... I don't know why that happened. That might have, that might have been mine. Or is it you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> they, um, so if, they can, if they can keep from falling into that, mm. then the sun might come out again, right? Mm. That, does that sort of make sense to you? Oh, I like how you framed that. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, first of all, the, the, to begin with, the, 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 as you, the premise is that the, the truckers have been peaceful, right? So they've been peaceful and they've kind of just been normal guys and they've affected the world. So the reason they have probably is it's not what you would have expected. You would, expect to, you would have expected people to be more aggressive as right from the beginning, right from the get-go. And you hear commentators saying, oh, Canadians are friendly. And, and I don't believe that, though. Canadians are just Canadians, right? We, we, we've got our own identity, but we're not necessarily this kind of passive, peaceful people. Well, we are, but that's not because of some transcendental idea. It's just the way we are. Yeah, you, you, were, you were talking about a little bit of the commentary that goes towards the truckers in that right. sense, and how they actually have, despite what people might think, been very nonviolent. Right. And there's a sense that that has been a, something that people have latched onto. They 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 find it interesting. They're they're motivated by it. So even the debate in Canada has shifted dramatically. People now, majority of people in Canada, uh, are against the mandates, the forceful in imposition in of, of mandates from Trudeau. And Trudeau has, um, through his anger, uh, lost lost some some of his whatever political capital he had right so how did he lose that because yeah again it's just the, the idea that he's so forceful mm -hmm. it's out of proportion to what you would expect mm -hmm. uh, so the truckers have been uh, of course um, resolute but um, not violent if they became violent it would lose they would lose all their their capital as well exactly, yeah. because there's a sense that um, there's a sense that we have when we look at situations and we relate to them that um, there has to be some kind of balance. And we just, in, in, it's a common language, but in depth psychology, we also have the sense that um, people can, uh, to, there's a sense that uh, mass psychology, mass movement, mass, uh, for, what they call it, mass formation psychology, that was discussed by Dr. Malone not right, too long right, ago. Right, right. But uh, there's that sense that uh, that does happen. In yeah. depth, depth psychology, they okay. do believe that there's a sense that a people can lose their their mooring, mm -hmm. uh, and it's easier for that to happen when there's enough people that are not uh, grounded in the psyche, in the in the unconscious. So we have in our society taken away mm -hmm. the relationships that people themselves have uh, to, uh, in our case, the, the Judeo-Christian concepts of of, um, relig of religion and spirituality it's been taken away from us so it, it's easy to f create fear in societies like ours that's i think that's why in the west mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly to me but now if i think about it not so surprisingly uh the, the mass fear that people had uh just they had no 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 way of dealing with the fear that was overwhelming them so it's a it's a individual on an individual level but it it seems to it seems there's a sense that it could spread and people can become you know fearful beyond like it, their, their psyche is overtakes them yeah yeah, yeah. the unconscious overtakes them but that, that, that reminds me of like how you talked about like aries was said to overtake somebody right but the group can be overtaken yes too and I always look at the, the flock of birds, you know, flying in random directions, right. being a predator, and it's right. just fear, right? Didn't get away. Right, right. Um, but see, in terms of like how this can move forward positively, then 
it becomes a really interesting question and a difficult one is to say, how does a society redevelop that what was provided by religion right. previously into a modern world that right. does embrace science, because science is very important, right. does embrace um, the values of the Enlightenment that right. were useful, yeah. but, but then also keeps that connection because that a disconnect becomes really dangerous when groups can get ideologically possessed by very strange disconnected right. ideas. And I know in my own life, um, with the dojo and teaching, mm. what I can see from people is whether they know it or not, they're crying out to connect with others. Mm. Because that has been a big part of what's happened the last few years, is right. this disconnect. Yeah. And so they're, they're, they're scared to connect mm. with other people. Yeah. But that's what their unconscious is really pushing to, because right. that's how you integrate in a lot of ways. Right. So, you know, um, it's really interesting watching this whole phenomenon pop up. Right. I saw a commentator uh, who's you know anti-trucker person mm. complaining about how they had bouncy castles and dance floors, mm. and I was like, "Is it are those positive things? Yeah, right? yeah. Is, is is that really that horrible <laughs> to do yeah, that? Really. People having fun, dancing. Yeah, yeah and, and and that means connecting. Mm. That means looking at each other and intera- interacting and getting that critical feedback you get from others. That right. That yeah. stimulates you in ways that your conscious mind not might not yeah. really understand. Exactly, and when you do like dancing or singing, or and you work together, and you're doing things together, or you're having fun together, you're um, yeah, that's you're using you're you're linked with your unconscious because the ego no longer has you're not just by yourself you're not just it's just this ego consciousness and looking around and afraid you're you're linked with other people there's another god from the the Greeks um, Dionysus right. you may have heard but uh, the, the the wine yeah. and uh, uh, the god of wine who um, but also the god of barriers to breaking barriers down oh yeah so it was about the idea of breaking barriers down so when you're when you're drinking wine or but when you're possessed by Dionysus you were uh, open to just talking with people yeah. it's just like the pub and that's yeah. so this so something we can't go to the pub anymore uh, so you can't you know, can you, Dionysus is not there. So you, you've, you've disconnected yeah. with something that you, is fundamental. It's like, as we talked about at the beginning, the org, it's an organ function. We yeah. need to be connected to people. Yeah. We can't be disconnected. So we need Dionysus. Not every, you don't want to be like drunk every day, all, all day, right? Balance. Right, yeah. balance, right? Yeah. You, you can't be, and you also, you can't be overtaken by Dionysus. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I've heard that, that uh, alcoholism and uh, suicide has risen in this, this, this time period where people are locked away. There's, there they're being overtaken. They're, there's instead of having a healthy relationship in a in a context could be ritual, mythic context, but even the pub f- serves as a function yeah. like that. People talking, relating. And it's different, of course, than like just sitting by yourself getting drunk, course, right? So there's that sense of. Um, well, that, I, I like that in, in terms of a of, a, of a, a a general enough comment that most people could take it and say, well, how can I start to reconnect again mm-hmm. a little bit because. Um, as I said, I, 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 people need it. We talk about that, that need mm-hmm. of it. And then if you're not really in touch with your unconscious, you might not think you need it. Mm-hmm. But you're, you know, why am I so stressed out? Why am I right. not feeling good about that? Why am I sleeping poorly? Right. Well, when was the last time you hugged somebody, right? Yeah. You know, and, um, and, and that's good because um, that covers two things that I think are really important about moving forward. Right. To recognize you do have needs that yeah. do need to be met through the community involvement that you're in right. and the relationships you have. But also, again, sort of like to the truckers or the yeah. organizers of this, yeah. is do not fall down into just to, to negative behaviors. Right. Keep yourself like that mirror to the sun. Keep yeah. that going so right. that you only propagate more light, more positive right. in that sense. I agree. I agree. Yeah, and, and just uh, self-reflection say, okay, it's, everything's not so bad. Yeah. Let's just take it easy. Okay, yeah. you know, there's this darkness uh, in Amat- the story of Amaterasu, the world is dark, yeah. but the gods, all the kami came together. They were dancing, singing, yeah. having fun, drinking, yeah. eating, and dancing. And that's what eventually caused the the angry god, the god to come out and um, yeah. realize well, there's, everything's there's, fine. There's a wonderful little mar- martial art connection that I can play out. It's kind of yeah. what I'm going to put is, but there's this really important point on your hand called Shalkam, yeah. and it's called a hand mirror. Oh. Right? And, the, and there's a lot of techniques, especially in Tai Chi, where there's like slower movements. Right. Where it's like your your palm will come in, and it's the idea is like you're looking into the mirror, yeah. and you're checking, am I clear? Am I, yeah. 
from a place of peace to a place of positive, right. and then I can engage into the world. Right. But if I'm not clear, whatever I do as I engage in the way, I'm going to work. Right. And so that balance then is yeah. critical. And right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah, it's yeah. a good, good way of going about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been, you know, whatever, it's been almost two hours, I think, pretty much. Yeah. And, and I definitely could probably talk to you for a long time. Yeah. But I really appreciate your time and yeah, your thoughts. Thanks. And um, I feel like, um, yeah, it could be quite a few more fun episodes down the line. Yeah, yeah. definitely. We could, because you could make a part two of this one if you want. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, do you have anything you want to plug about your stuff you're doing? I know you had a documentary at some point. Yeah, I, uh, I do have a. Um, a documentary which I just put it up there it's free nobody everybody can watch it it's a uh, uh, folk myth media they can go there it's a YouTube channel and right. uh, it's in Japanese and um, I put a link to our previous one to there as well I just set it up okay. about a month ago oh. and then uh, but the documentaries are out in Japan and uh, so it's, it's, it's viewed there it's, it's um, a local just a local theaters uh, but I'm going to put up the English uh, version as well up there as well people can take a look at that um, it's also on, on um, Amazon it's streaming but only UK and America unfortunately so but I'll put it up so everybody can take a look at it and just if they have questions they can yeah absolutely write to me yeah that's great I'll make sure there's a link to that in the post okay. but uh, thank you for your time again no thank you have a cheers day.